Okay, hi everybody. This is um, continuing commentary on the fourth initiation and just so happens to be Easter Sunday here in Finland in the year 2020 and uh, April 12th. Here we're so close to Russia and um, to the uh, type of church that they have into the Greek Orthodox Church. And as a result, um, maybe tomorrow is really the day of resurrection. If you count three days in the tomb, then Sunday is a little premature. But that's the way it's celebrated uh, in the West. So we're getting ready for our uh, Easter resurrection broadcast, you know, resurrection uh, following the fourth degree and toward the fifth degree. But the true resurrection is a part of a higher ascension that takes us to the seventh plane, takes us to the logoic plane. And that is. Um, of real importance because the Christ symbolically is said to uh, sit at the right hand of the Father, and the Father is uh, Sanat Kumar in Shambhala, and that a placement of his in the cosmic ethers is on the highest one of the cosmic ethers, which is the Sea of Fire, the Logoic Plane. It is um, true, I think, uh, that Christ, the Christ, has not yet taken the complete seventh initiation, and I think his work in the Aquarian uh, Age is going to bring him to that point along with the Buddha. But meanwhile, of course, he has access to that high point of ascension, the usual point of ascension, however, is the sixth uh, degree and the monadic plane. And when he disappeared and was taken up in a cloud, that's the best way that the people at that time with their type of education could um, understand what was happening. After this, I think there'll, there'll have to be a break because we're heading into our transformed conference in, well, in just about two weeks. So it's, uh, it'll be a streamed conference. We must keep going, of course. But this is the um, it's not a day of death. This is the day of rejoicing. Of course, uh, death is uh, sweeping uh, humanity and the world, even interspecies transfer from cats and human beings to human beings and cats and to tigers and who knows. Uh, it seems to jump the species line, this coronavirus, and is said to have been uh, many more times more dangerous than the so-called Spanish flu misnomer, really, um, of a hundred years ago, which struck twice, really, and the second time being devastating, most devastating. And uh, if they had had uh, that kind of virus we have now, with only the kind of medicine that they have, uh, then who knows? It could have been uh, much more uh, destructive, much more. But Sanat Kumara has his purposes, and the form has to be appropriate to the type of inner being that expresses through the form. And there has been, I think, uh, a variance from the kind of form it is supposed to be. 
And so this is a um, drastic cleansing and very painful for so many. Hopefully those who come through it will have a deeper appreciation of it, and especially if they are in power, as is the case of the present Prime Minister of England, who it seems to be on the mend and recovering and leaving the hospital. And I think, let's see what the, that will mean for the kinds of policies. Nothing like going through the experience, you know. And that is the key. We can talk a lot about different stages of evolution, but to actually pass through the experience and to have it current, that's a much, much different thing. Well, we'll, we'll continue now. This is all from Dinah 2, and there's quite a bit here of the fourth initiation, and that's our purpose. I don't, I don't think I'm necessarily going to be able to cover every single reference to the fourth degree that's found in the Tibetan's books, but uh, I am fortunate in having some compilations here made by others, in this case by uh, Zach Rymill, uh, who's done a really good job, and it gives me something to work from. So here we are in Dinah 2, page 270. These expressions of the evolutionary development of humanity are related to the first manifesting qualities of the will aspect. We think we know something about will, we know so very little. And then there's a progression as well as the expression of the will deepens. And we're just talking about the first manifesting qualities. When I say this, I give you a hint reminding you that the candidate for initiation grows by the recognition and the interpretation of hints and by extracting from the from a hint its true significance as you may know in the old days the hint was given by the master but now a mass of material of written material in this case by a master is set is spread before the student and the student must um, recognize that which uh, emerges, which pops out, so to speak, from off the page for him or for her, as being especially um, significant. Always there will be a statement which is not fully fathomed, but which points towards the next step uh, ahead. So we have to extract from a hint its true significance, and that's not always easy. DK quotes, uh, well, DK quotes another disciple, probably himself, uh, whose master told him that all ashrams are found upon the Antikarana. And he seems to imply it took him quite a long time to um, grasp the significance. Going on, this will not, as so many believe, is not, excuse me, <laughs> this will is not, as so many believe, a forceful impression of intention. I mean, maybe that's a little aspect of it. It is not a fixed determination to do thus and so, or to make certain things to be. Uh, I suppose it's not bad to have such a power, but there's something deeper going on here. It is fundamentally an expression of the law of sacrifice. And under this law, the unit recognizes responsibility, identifies itself with the whole, 
and learns the significance of the words having nothing, that is sacrifice, and yet possessing all things, universality. And I ask you, he says, to focus on this uh, uh, idea from uh, the great initiate, St. Paul. Well, there are many definitions of will, and we're not really coming to any of them with full understanding. It's fundamentally an expression of the law of sacrifice, the very first law of the soul. And under this law, the unit, that is you and I, human beings, recognizes uh, responsibility, which we are told elsewhere is the first real indication that the soul is grasping its instrument. The unit recognizes responsibility, identifies itself with the whole, and that step is most important. And I would say it must be practiced, because if you're anything like me, some days it's there, some days it's not identifies itself with the whole and learns the esoteric significance of the words having nothing, that is, it's all been sacrificed, and yet possessing all things. It's kind of like a, a lower and higher expression of the sign Taurus. We do not have, we are. And, of course, Aries gets into the mix. I would ask you to reflect upon these words of the great initiate, St. Paul. The full expression of these highest spiritual qualities from the angle of the modern man comes uh, after the fourth initiation. I mean, there's much to assimilate and... Uh, this rising into heaven is certainly not the end. Human beings are always looking for, you know, the termination of a difficult process, but um, it just keeps going, really. It has so forever. So um, the full expression of these highest spiritual qualities from the angle of modern man comes after the fourth initiation, that of the great renunciation. If we were a very, very, very high initiate, then the full expression would be placed in successive initiations, and we could not even determine which ones, because the initiatory process, the opening up, into a condition of being the wholeness just continues until one knows one is and is the one universal actor. But anyway, ordinarily, there's a real detachment from the veils at the fourth initiation. And veils are found on the cosmic... Uh, well, they're found on the solar mental plane as the causal body, egoic lotus, and they're found below in the personality. But I think we'll discover that the entire vehicles or the range of vehicles within the cosmic physical plane are all veils in a way. When, when does the final unveiling come? Even the universe is a veil compared to absoluteness. But uh, for practical purposes and uh, in terms of what we seem to be and will seem to be for quite a while, everything is then relinquished. 
in order that everything may be held in trust. Those, to those who give all, all is given, we might say. Everything is uh, relinquished for personal purposes and offered on the altar, which seeks the advancement of the wholeness, the solar system, the system of the cosmic logos and super cosmic logos and beyond, everything is offered to every larger whole. We always offer up what we are, what we have to the next perceived wholeness. Everything is then relinquished in order that everything may be held in trust. The Buddha preserved his vehicles, you know, but uh, those uh, triadal vehicles, but they were for the coming of the Christ later, who adopted them, and maybe around the year 1965, 66, when so much in the consciousness movement presented itself. Everything is then relinquished in order that everything may be held in trust and used for the good of all. And that's a Kantian moral imperative. Basically, is this for the good of all? What I'm doing, about to do, for whom is it? Is it for that illusory something we call ourselves, or is it for a much truer and higher and real self, which is consisting of all? Uh, human beings, and really of all kingdoms, used for the good of all. The will to good then dominates. I've always felt about the will to good that it had uh, a mixture of the first ray and the second ray. I know when you consider the good, the beautiful, and the true, the good is the first ray associated with it, but I have a feeling about it, that there is this idea of a completed pattern which involves the second ray, the ray of the divine pattern. Hence the necessity for the scientific construction of the rainbow bridge, which connects us with a realization of what is the good of all and connects us with those higher reaches of our uh, energy system from which emanate uh, the will to good. Hence the necessity for the scientific construction of the Rainbow Bridge, hence the emphasis upon the monad, which is really something Master DK is bringing forth in a practical way. We could talk about our Father in Heaven as God, but uh, we don't realize that with the idea of God imminent, uh, we are that God. Hence the emphasis upon the monad, the Father aspect which can now be revealed and known. It would be excessively burning and destroying if it were prematurely revealed. So. In this question of the unveiling, which is evolution, time is everything. The monad, the father aspect, which can now be revealed and known because the work of eons is culminating in a general soul contact where humanity as a whole is concerned. We're entering the fifth kingdom of nature. Any initiative of the first degree is placing foot in the fifth kingdom of nature. And, um, well, that's so true for so many of us because, you know, the real student of Master DK, ongoing student, will have taken the first initiation. 
rare is the exception. So yes, uh, we're not completely soul infused yet, but we are also reaching towards the being which we are and have forgotten that we are. So the work of eons, great cycles, is culminating in a general soul contact and people like you and me should be emerging, definitely emerging into that soul contact and soul expression when we're not being obscured by other factors that are related to our personality. This is testified to by the fact that many, so very many thousands, it's going to be millions, maybe it is now, so very many thousands have, as I have several times told you, taken the first initiation, the birth of the Christ in the heart, the the birth in Bethlehem, and the, you know, the beginning of the elevation of the sacral to the throat, and uh, the relation to the higher power, which each one of us has, and actually is brilliant, what they've done in AA to go beyond religiosity's terminology and uh, make it open to everybody. The higher reaches become open to everybody as the higher power. The Christ child is present in truth. Something is growing in us which is deeply loving and harmonious and will find its fulfillment through the uh, sequence of impending initiations. The Christ child is present in truth and the human heart and mind, it's a Venusian amalgamation, are becoming aware of that fact. The mind as it is in Christ is beginning to appear And the heart is feeling this and how it goes out to others. And a whole new sense of relationship is building. The Christ child is present in truth and the human heart and mind are becoming aware of that fact. And may it be so for all of us in the coming years which will be so important for the manner in which we enter the Aquarian Age. The Aquarian Age, of course, will come. It's on its way, and you cannot stop those uh, planetary movements and uh, the uh, rotation of the globe and the spinning upon its axis and the orientation of the vernal equinox, you, you don't stop those things, but whether there will be delay, and DK sometimes talks about a 300 year delay, is very much up to us and to the sacrifices we make and really those sacrifices being allied to the responsibility we take. The goal for thousands everywhere is the demonstration of the Christ spirit. I wonder if it's not millions now. And the exemplification of a life conditioned by love. The exemplification of a life conditioned by love. Mm. 
not so conditioned, especially in terms of uh, the relationship of religions to each other and of nations to each other. And modeled upon that of the Christ or Sri Krishna, his earlier incarnation, or at least one of his earlier incarnations, there, there seemed to have been a figure in there somewhere called Maitreyi, Maitreya, Maitreyi. I think maybe a female figure and uh, exemplified by loving kindness and a profound understanding of uh, Indian philosophy. One day we'll be able, when it is suitable, for our development and for our usefulness to trace the incarnations of the great figures, not just our curiosity there being satisfied, but tracing the um, development so that we can learn something. For instance, it's so useful, isn't it? to think of the warrior Joshua, the son of Nun, becoming the, um, the priest uh, Jeshua, becoming the high priest Joshua, another Joshua, only different, and becoming finally the initiate Jesus of the third degree, at first, and then on to the fourth degree, and then becoming, with the cooperation of Apollonius of Tyana, the master of the fifth degree, and becoming, who knows when, the Chohan Jesus, the head of the sixth ray ashram. Sixth ray, his monadic ray, at least on the monadic plane, what it is on the Bogoic plane is at the first uh, major monadic ray of the second. Well, Christ is said to be his great ideal, so maybe it is the second. But you see, you know, all the way from the invader of the promised land, I suppose a great idealist and uh, a commanding military figure, a general, not the sweet and uh, silently suffering, gentle soul Jesus, but a great general. And that we understand by tracing his lives. There are some lives in there to trace for the master Bureaucracy, you know, as Roger Bacon and Francis Bacon and, uh, oh, an earlier sacrificial life, uh, which was ended through a kind of martyrdom uh, in the early centuries AD. And maybe, who knows, maybe as we're told in masonry, or as it is hinted, the architect of King Solomon's temple, Hiram Abiff. Who knows the exact sequence? But when the sequence can be revelatory, then that's when we'll learn all about it. We want to avoid the fate of the of the donkey. <laughs> well, you know, don't crush the donkey with a load of a camel. That's what Master Moria tells us. But someone said, I think it's Moria for his picturesque language. Even a um, even a donkey can carry a library on his back. Useless but you're carrying all that learning around and it's not applied in a way that can really help the greater whole. So interesting. 
we begin to discover what a man really is at the fourth initiation, when greater unveilings have to, having to do with the um, dense physical body of the planetary Logos are accomplished. And then we start getting into that area of life, which is principled in this particular incarnation of our planetary Logos. We have to assume that if the solar Logos, and apparently he did have earlier incarnations, then those um, lesser beings who are planetary beings um, associated with various of his chakras at different times also had their incarnations, and that would be including the Earth. And certainly the higher planets, um, which are now synthesizing and sacred, they certainly had their appearance in uh, earlier solar systems. There's so much that occultism can teach us, but people are afraid of anything that's too big, you know. They, they don't want to be dwarfed. They don't want their identity dwarfed. When in fact, the ageless wisdom will teach us of the reality of such an expansive identity that we certainly can't even fathom it. But countless are the times when we have been through this descent and reascent, and when starting out as the universal whole, we have become minimized and minimized until the prescribed limit has been reached. You know, let's just say there's no true actualization of absolute infinity in any particular finite universe. So a limit is reached. And who knows how that's determined? Probably it's uh, determined by the <clears throat> universal logos. Thus far shall I go and no further. I shall not uh, continue uh, on my way to the infinitesimal which also, in a finite system, cannot really be reached. That is the actual infinitesimal, not the theoretical. Well, there's a couple of other things going on here um, about points of revelation. We have the formulas, the hints, and the points of revelation, all of which are revealing more and more to stimulate our intuition so that it can grasp immediately what's going on instead of having to most probably erroneously think its way towards the truth. I mean, thinking is important, of course, but it has to give way to the transcendental mind of Mercury, which is a kind of straight knowledge and a, a sight of the actuality of things. Here's Dinah 2 again, page 369. As we consider these revelations, <clears throat> I guess we're in the points of revelation, I would like to take them up with you from a somewhat new angle. I would ask you to remember that the concept of light, capital L, will always be established by you mentally, along with the revelation itself. In a way, matter is light. Light, uh, ma uh, water is matter. Light is water is matter. So our whole universe is a form of uh, condensed light. 
what the formulas are for that, we'll leave that to the masters. I would ask you also to remember that I'm dealing with revelations which are no longer true revelations because they have been formulated, you know, in the abstract mind by the initiates of today and made visible in words. A revelation is a shocking realization. But once the minds have begun to work upon it and uh, given words to it and uh, whatever types of formulations can be conceived, then the revelation is no longer uh, related to a sudden realization. Revelations have to be worked upon by the abstract mind so that they can be brought closer to the lower levels and uh, made available to those people in whom or for whom the intuition is not completely functioning. Revelation is, therefore, he says, as far as you are concerned, of two kinds. Number one, those that have been recognized and perceived in the past and consequently have been reduced to words, using the phrase in its occult and limiting significance. In some uh, symbolic form of uh, sound, the actual revelation has been encapsulated, and never the whole thing can be encapsulated, but enough to begin to fertilize the minds of those for whom the immediacy of intuition is not going to be working, not yet. Number two, those that are yet as, <clears throat> that are as yet <clears throat> unrevealed, to any except those who have taken the fourth initiation. It's really, we're dealing, dealing with so many realities which are inconceivable, and we can say in relation to our mind, oh, I know that, or I know that, but it's just a mental knowing of something that is known far more deeply and authentically once the intuition the transcendental mind is at play. So they're as yet unrevealed to any except those who have taken the fourth degree. The three points of revelation indicated by me can usefully be related by you to the first three initiations. And of course, he goes on, I think there are five points of revelation though they necessarily have an interpretation appropriate to all the initiations. The limitations are transcended, and their application, the application of these so-called lesser revelations, are enhanced and have their appropriateness in relation to still higher initiations. I mean, one day we shall be absolutely omniscient. Of course, we already are, because we are, you know, the one being who sees all possibilities. But it seems that um, while that is going on, it's not really going on here below. But there comes time, a time in timelessness, when that revelation is again the focus. So, you know, uh, this is a manual for initiation, and we do have to naturally think that it is ahead of our powers of apprehension. Let me express for you here in their briefest form, there's other ways to do it, the four points of revelation already indicated, and then, quote, in the light, 
let us consider them as suggested earlier. So always, you know, DK is giving us enough for us to realize that we just know really what? Nothing. <laughs> Everything we think we know, come back again and examine it with still greater sensitivity and less confinement by those symbolic sounds we call words. But, you know, as we persist, the dawning will come. That's inevitable. A sincere student of three or four thousand years will know something more than one who has picked up the, let's say, the Secret Doctrine or the Alice Bailey books relatively recently. And eventually the development of omniscience will be present for all. Okay, uh, here are the, uh, we consider these in the light, and he does in Dinah 2, energy follows thought, and the eye directs the energy. So what we concentrate upon, what we uh, think upon, uh, is a conduit for energy, and energy can be extracted via that conduit. This involves, it's the lowest, it involves the physical plane, and relates to the first initiation in which we finally begin to realize that thoughts are things, and we are in an energic interaction with anything we think upon. This is concerning the Ajna Center and the so-called Third Eye. What else would he call it, I wonder? Maybe he has a better way of uh, describing it. But remember, the Ajna Center is not only an organ of initiation. It is that, and it's active at the third degree. And it's really active when the spiritual triad must be enjoined. But before that, it helps to uh, pull together to integrate the personality, even the non-spiritual personality. So where we direct our attention, our thought, our energy will follow, and we will have also access to the energy which is contained, part of, constituent to, the object or living system to which we address our thought. In any way, uh, the beginner has to recognize that thoughts are things. He is responsible for his thoughts. He's even responsible for the direction of his thoughts. Sometimes DK says, don't speculate on this or that because it's going to uh, be profitless to you and even dangerous. You know, certain sources of evil, uh, those who are, are adept at using those sources or being those sources can pick up your attention. So if you think too much in the wrong direction, you can evoke that upon which you think. More of this will be known by us when we have elevated or become elevated to the point when we are guardians and uh, not those who simply have to be guarded. Number two, the will is an expression of the law of sacrifice. 
So it's your willingness to sacrifice according to the need which evokes the will. The will is an expression of the very first law of the soul, the law of sacrifice. And as we can conform to the need and uh, renounce that which is lesser and not absolutely necessary, this power of the will as it is, will truly begin to express us, uh, express itself. A lot of um, pondering to be done on this question of the will. So when this involves the astral plane, I guess we're distinguishing will from uh, desire. A desire usually seeks to add to the one who is expressing it. And the will is a relinquishment, a responsible relinquishment on behalf of others and on behalf of the whole. This is relating to the second initiation and great is the battle. Well, I would say that at that initiation, we have the beginning of the kind of warfare of um, Mars and Vulcan, which in a certain sense, right before real initiation, the third degree culminates in a very great battle. And the moon is veiling Vulcan in that particular case. Finally, spiritual will will enter. But here we do have to sort out the difference between uh, desire and uh, a real uh, sacrificial uh, relinquishment of unnecessary things wanted. This concerns the heart center, the advancing point of life. Maybe that's quite a hint there. The disciple becomes the advancing point of life, but maybe the radiance of the heart center as it becomes more intensely luminous is seen as an advancing point of light, provided it stays consistent. And uh, the transfer from the solar plexus to the heart is a key transference at the second initiation, but then so is the continuation from the solar, rather from the sacral center, to the throat that just must continue as we enter into two true creativity spiritual intelligence uh, mental illumination and many are the disciples who are fighting it out here between vulcan and mars you know vulcan is so close to the sun that if you have a tough aspect astrologically between Mars and the Sun, it may be an indication that a battle between spiritual will and desire is uh, occurring in your chart, maybe an opposition, maybe a square, etc. You can look for the deeper meaning of that. And probably, you know, the various ages of man proceed. And uh, as we get older, we want less for our personal self and more for the wholeness. Then there's number three. It starts to get really esoteric, point of revelation, upon which much meditation will be required. The monad is to the planetary logos, what the third eye is to man. Looking out uh, upon creation and uh, what has been created by others, the monad sees things as they are. It's a single eye in a way 
and the planetary logos grasps through the uh, monad some kind of uh, very synthetic uh, vision. Something is looking through that third eye. You know, outposts of consciousness is the idea. We are always um, potentially outposts of consciousness for our master or for some teacher. I always try to introduce that with our monthly meditation that when we take the shortening golden path into the indigo disc, we are becoming outposts of consciousness to a degree uh, of the Tibetan. And we can um, see through his eyes and uh, he can see what we see. So this is the mental plane and the first real initiation in which the monad, not completely, is summoned and it does have an effect. Once the causal body is dissipated, destroyed by whatever method, you'll find the method in the beginning of Letters on Occult Meditation. Once that destruction takes place, there is a far more direct and unimpeded relationship with the monad, but not until the fifth degree does it become really, really close. And at, at uh, the sixth degree, one realizes one is the monad, whether or not one keeps one's uh, vestures or triadal vehicles. So this concerns the head center, Ajna, so far. Ajna, heart, and head. And this is the light of... Um, Light of purpose, maybe purpose really begins to come in at the third degree. I've always felt that purpose is the second aspect of the first ray, and will is the first aspect of the first ray. Because uh, so far it's difficult for me to conceive of purpose without pattern, and the second ray is the ray of the divine pattern. Then we get on to a new area of study. The purpose itself is only an energy released within the council chambers, the confines of the council chambers. I suspect that's on the seventh uh, cosmic subplane, the sea of fire, maybe for Senat Kamara alone or in some way it's on his etheric presentation is on the first subplane of the Logoic plane, which is the first cosmic subplane of the cosmic uh, physical plane. So always there's a new purpose, but purpose involves relation. I think that's what I want to say. Purpose involves relation. And uh, the second ray is the ray of the divine relation. It's not, in a way, the ray of homogeneity. It's uh, a ray of relate, uh, harmonious relationship between the constituent parts of any whole. There, the purpose must take shape because, well, we're talking about shape, you know. There's form again of some kind, some ultimate archetypal form for the cosmic physical plane, and it involves the buddhic or intuitional plane. You know, we begin to fathom what the purpose is when we're able to touch the buddhic or the intuitional plane, and that for so many of us is a, a goal. I don't, you know, we're we're not even yet higher manas. And that's one of the objectives of the next 2,000 years, to make uh, the race of men, man, men and women, more 
uh, subject to the intuition uh, as it manifests through higher manas. And then in the sixth root race, we will have uh, the cultivation of the true intuition. Apparently, it takes a long time. Apparently, the uh, sixth root race lasts about 10 million years. It's a lot longer than the Aryan race has apparently lasted. So hang on, you know, we've got a lot of development yet to undergo. Patience is so required in this whole business. This relates to the fourth initiation and concerns the throat center and true light, light upon the path, true light. real light, not the light of possibility, probability, it might be, you know, this is real vision on the Buddhic plane. Interesting associating the fourth initiation with the throat center. So often it's associated with the heart center because of the suffering and because of the synthesis. But there must be new developments in relation to the potentials of the fourth initiation at four times four, sixteen, sixteen petals. So I think uh, the the capacities of the throat center are released in a new way. There's also a fourfoldness of the adjunct center. Got to count, you know, got to count. Because in the numbers, much is revealed. Then we, then we have maybe something not yet discussed, and it's really big. When the light of the seven rays, I suppose seven rays within a certain sphere of expression, is blended with that of the seventh ray, must be a big ray of a still greater sphere of expression, then light supernal can be known. But a light supernal, let's say, that is not the light supernal of Capricorn of the third degree. But uh, is there any limitation to the degree of supernality, if there is such a word? Um, the degree of supernality which increases as the light intensifies. And this involves the atmic plane because it's the fifth plane. And the atmic plane is going to involve the fifth initiation mastership, but a pivot as was done for the Buddha or by the Buddha towards the sixth initiation, which he gradually gained. He achieved nirvana, but nirvana is um, the name applied to the fifth or atmic plane. And then comes a minor center, but it must have a very occult meaning. It concerns the alpha major center and extraplanetary light, and I suppose it means that um, we're really moving beyond the confines of the planet and gathering in potentials from other planets. Well, you know, with uh, this being Easter and so much coming up, I don't want to pretend that I can in good conscience uh, just forge ahead. My mind will be on other things. So this would be uh, end of... Uh, fourth initiation, and it would be compilation number four. And we're already on page uh, six to page eight. And we're starting with the fifth compilation, but like I say, I keep on thinking I'm going to be cut short. And this is uh, program number five uh, on page eight of this document.
I hope not to get lost. You know, maybe I found a way. I hope so. Well, obviously, we're hardly in a place, given our initiatory status, to um, to really understand what is the light of the seven rays and how to blend it with the superior uh, seventh ray. I, I do think um, if I can find this reference. Not, it's not quite a reference. It's uh, it's something else, actually. It and it's called what is it called? Nirvana or something like that? Or is it called um, Parabrahm? And, you know, you do see a resolution there. You see how seven resolve into one. And actually, it's a pretty good uh, description when the light of the seven rays uh, merge into the light of the seventh ray. Because we see the, the seventh in order sort of taking up the quality or energy of these other seven well that sounds like something that higher initiates would be able to contemplate on with profit for right now we have simply to notice that uh, what centers are involved as in the center for the first point of revelations um, Correct? I think so. Just got to get it. And the third eye, and then uh, heart center for the second initiation, we've always known it has been involved. Second point of revelation and um, head center. So it's uh, so far Ajna, heart and head. Followed by, interestingly enough, the throat center. So in terms of order, it's not the usual order. And then finally, the outer major. So just visualize those for a moment. The ajna, the heart, the head the throat, and the outer major. And all of these points of revelation have to carry to us their revelation as we learn to study them in the right way and have the revelation dawn. One day I'll have to take up the difference between revelation and realization. Realization seems... Uh, to be a deeper understanding of that which is shown through revelation. You can be presented with something that is new, it's a revelation to you, but is its significance truly and completely known? That is the question. Well, okay, friends, I'm hoping that this has uh, done the job. And um, getting ready for the Easter broadcast, and uh, the rising, you know, the resurrection, it can be used in so many different ways. And finally, at the seventh degree, it's certainly not those antiquated uh, and kind of ghoulish uh, pictures of cemetery, cemeteries with with very unpleasant forms rising out of their graves. And who knows on what day. <laughs> I think that uh, the human mind has a lot to do to expand to a more beautiful and realistic 
uh, understanding of what resurrection can be. So I guess what I'm going to do is just uh, say bye for now. That's about an hour, about, and um, move on to the um, to the manner in which maybe we human beings can understand the resurrection. Okay, many blessings, lots of lots of love to you.